whatever you need to do. And give it a moment. Maybe online. And you can actually start. Hello. We are here for our <clears throat> weekly farmsteading stories <clears throat> with myself and Mr. Lucian, sometimes the boys. Today you get just me to just talk. Pretend I'm not even here. You can, you can go ahead. Um, so, do I need to do anything here? No, nope, you're good. You're, you're live. Do you're, I need to turn the volume down? No, nope, you're all good. Go ahead. So we are here every week on Thursdays to talk about farmsteading. Watch for comments over here. And there you are. Bye-bye. Let's go, kids. Um, <clears throat> farmsteading. Come on. We call it farm studying, the melding of homesteading and farming. Um, we're doing this series so that we can share stories from our experience. Um, do you want your phone? Share stories from our experience. I'll be right up, okay? I have ice cream and chocolate and cake and pizza. Go have some ice cream. Come chocolate. on. I'll be right. I'll be up in a moment, okay? Go Let's go, you guys. Know. Thank you. I'll be right there. I'll be right there. Let's go. Come on. Maybe you can watch something too. Come on. Come on. So, yeah, the, the weekly series. I don't know if, uh, if you haven't been here before. Um, again, the series is so that we can share stories from our experience, um, hopefully to inspire you to just share knowledge, share um, our trials and tribulations, um, share our successes, our failures, the homesteading journey is, of course, forever. Like it's a lifelong commitment if you want it to be. Um, and you know, we we are committed for for a lifetime experience with homesteading. I'm sorry, I'm fidgeting so much, but um, we have been at this uh, farm for two years now in October, and we're here in Missouri, central South Missouri. And before that, we were in California on a really beautiful um, property as well. And, you know, when Lucian and I met, um, we quickly discovered that we both had a, a shared dream of wanting to run a farm and share our um, passion for teaching with the world and with students and um, with our community. So that's how we ended up here. Um, this farm studying conversations, um, we're on episode 20, has evolved from us starting with some uh, practical tips to uh, now it's kind of a little bit more free flow where we are sharing some of the things that are on our minds and um, some greater discussions that complement and actually, you know, intersect with farming, homesteading, um, sustainability, and things like that. And we usually start with what's been happening on the farm this last week. Um, and so this week, I'll, I'll kind of give a little recap. Um, this week was one of the weeks that we have homeschool children here. 
you may have heard us talk about this before, but um, there's a local group here in Missouri, um, well, many local groups, but the one closest to us is a self-organized group of families that um, homeschool their children and do additional outings together to supplement their curriculum. And so we have their, um, these families here twice a month. And yesterday was another day with our, um, with our visitors. We talked about vegetables and uh, made pizza together, which was super fun. Uh, we used the cob oven that we built during the permaculture design course that we had here in June. And um, the pizzas turned out amazing. We started in the garden where they were able to harvest their veggies and their herbs. And I had made the dough already. Um, and so all of the kids got together and they had their own pizzas and then we cooked them in the oven and it was just like such a cool, cool experience, awesome day. Um, these kids are really, I think why we enjoy this uh, time with them so much is because they, they really exemplify like what um, a free spirited child can um how they can really thrive and you know of course there are a lot of um ideals uh, ideas and philosophies on educating children and raising them um but one of the reasons why Lucian and I have committed to homesteading is so that our children could grow up more um I don't necessarily want to say wild and free, but maybe, yeah, maybe it is wild and free. Um, the term wild, of course, has sometimes a negative connotation, but um, with that wildness, it really just comes with like an expansiveness, which I think is really beautiful. And um, so much of the system that we're in, in our, in our mainstream culture really works hard to control and to dampen our wildness and expansiveness, which I'm, I'm going to talk more about today. Um, so the, the wild learners were here, um, really love having them. And what else is happening here on the farm? Um, we started to milk uh, one of the other La Mancha moms that we have. Um, a little bit more frequently, which requires separating her from her uh, children, her kids um, for a portion of the day. Her kids are really, uh, they're quite old now, um, well beyond like a weaning age. And um, they're super healthy and thriving. They're two twin girls that she has. Um, the mama is Joy. So Joy has been milking um, once or twice a day now, which is really cool. And the milk is really, really beautiful, really creamy and this like luscious texture. Um, if you are familiar with Weston A. Price, which um, is a Weston A. Price Foundation, talks a lot about nutrition. And you may be also hearing a lot of things coming up about raw milk and how beneficial it is for the body. Um, and it's true, a lot of, uh, all of that is, is really true. Um, for us, we discovered that um, raw cow milk wasn't actually as um, complementary to our bodies as raw goat milk is. And that makes sense um, because both Lucian and I, from what we know about our, our families, we have not done actual gene testing, but from what we know of our families, they have been in the Mediterranean region, um, of course, expanding up to Romania. And especially for my people in Italy and Greece, there were not a lot of milking cows there, dairy cows, and of course there was sheep and goat. And so it makes sense to us that um, our bodies are able to digest this milk and um, it actually is like very energizing and um, nutritious for us. Um, if you wanna learn more about the benefits of raw milk, you can do some more research at Weston A. Price. Um, and I 
probably talk more about this again in future sessions, but um, the uh, going back to the difference between the, the cow and the goat milk, uh, we noticed that our sign Elios was having some kind of um, almost like a, a reaction to the goat milk, or excuse me, the cow milk. And um, so once we stopped giving him raw cow milk, which we were getting from a woman down the road, those um, reactions stopped. So now he's having this goat milk and it's like really, um, he loves it and we're not having any kind of those reactions. Um, and the other things that are happening right now, um, Lucian moved the chickens um, to a different portion of the property for more grass. We luckily have had a tremendous amount of rain uh, the last few weeks, two to three really big systems came through and uh, really turned everything verdant again on the property. Um, we, you know, as I, we mentioned in previous weeks, there have been a lot of farmers who were very concerned and probably still are uh, about the um, drought that's been happening uh, in this area, in uh, places where hay is collected and harvested. And again, that is a problem because uh, these farmers with um, cattle and larger herds of other animals were using hay that specifically was harvested and dried for winter. Um, but because there have been minimal harvest happening, um, they were having to use that feed now, which is, uh, of course, concerning. Uh, so we're praying that this these last few systems of rain actually really uh, helped. And uh, we're noticing that the, the neighbors who do a lot of haying their um, fields are looking really lush again. So I'm, I'm hopeful that uh, the, that rain has really helped. And I don't know about in your region, but we have definitely noticed the shift to fall uh, really gently moving its way in. The goldenrod is blooming and um, that typically is a sign that summer is winding down. When you're outside, you can feel in the breeze, that little bit of like a little bit of a chill, and the nights now are low, um, lower than 70. So that's that's pretty indicative. In the forecast for us, it's looking like 80s, high 80s uh, through this month in September, which is still amazing. Well, that's so great. Uh, we still have hopefully another month and a half of uh, warm and beautiful weather. I was reflecting on the weather here and um, just kind of feeling a little dreadful, <laughs> a little dread, like dreading this winter, um, kind of feeling like, gosh, I don't, I didn't get enough summer. I'm, I'm really kind of anxious about winter coming in again. Um, and, you know, it seems like in this, you know, here in Missouri where we are, um, we had, you know, really cold weather December through March, and then the rain started April through June, heavy rains, and then um, the end of June and July was scorching hot in the beginning of August, and now we're like kind of already in a cool down. So, it seems, and it's very surprising, it seems like this window of, of heat is, is quite short. Um, but then we also saw a recent uh, news article and a few different sources that said that this, um, this area might be part of a, a Midwest and also south of our country um, here in the United States that may see extreme heat um, within the next 50 years. So those trends are, um, of course, always speculative, but it's all of this to say is that following the weather and knowing your climate is like, is so important. It's, it's kind of like an obsessive thing for a lot of farmers. Um, you know, a lot of people, when they wake up in the morning, they go and look at Instagram or their email. The first thing I look at the weather, <laughs> I look at the weather and I also look at the tracker to see where our, our livestock dog is. 
Um, those are sort of like the first things that I reach for in the morning. Um, the weather really sets the tone for what's going to happen that day and what, you know, what is going to be feasible, what is going to um, be able to accomplish given the temperature, the, the weather, the precipitation, any of those things. Um, and that's part of like the another one of the reasons why you know we have decided to make this move to homesteading is because i i feel deeply um i feel so much better when i am in deep connection to nature and to the rhythms of the seasons it really actually um not only symbolically but like on a probably on an actual cellular level really resonates for me and how I'm able to function uh, through the year. And, um, you know, there are also these shifts that happen within your body um, as the seasons change, of course. And like right now, Luciana and I both feel like more on the lean side because we've been working outside. We've been spending most of our time outside um, but in the next few months, I can guarantee we're going to be reaching for um, more soups, more baked goods. Um, and that's, of course, in preparation for winter um, to kind of like fatten up again. <laughs> I do not mind fattening up over winter, that's for sure. Um, and we also, other things that are happening, my dad is here for the week visiting and um, he hasn't been here since February. He's been back home in Reno working. So he's here for the week to visit. And then he most likely will be again here with us over winter. Uh, right now he's working on garlic. Uh, Lucian had harvested all the garlic um, probably almost eight weeks ago now. And um, now they have been cured and dried outside. They're ready to be, uh, we're cutting the big stalks off cutting the little roots on the bottom, cleaning the outer shell from soil, and then we can store them um, probably down here in the basement. So my dad is working on that right now and also eating a lot at the same time. Um, sometimes he's like, oh, that was delicious. And then sometimes his eyes are watering because it's burning, his uh, <laughs> super hot. Um, I wanna say that Garlic is a incredibly potent medicine and we often overlook the culinary medicines that are available to us because they are so common and seem so simple and um, but they really are so potent. Oregano and garlic are some of the most amazing antivirals that you can uh, have access to. And garlic luckily is easy to grow. Right now, you should be thinking about where you're going to source garlic seed if you are hoping to plant some in October, which I hope you do. I hope, I hope. Um, I really hope you consider uh, growing garlic this year. Uh, what ends up happening is um, you plant it in the fall and then you harvest it in the summer. My uh, One of my mentors, uh, from farming, she would always say that you plant it around Halloween. You can think of Dracula uh, and garlic um, and then harvest it around the 4th of July. So it's obviously there's a few variations um, in terms of time considering your location, but that's the general window. And it's very easy. You put the, um, the seeds in the ground, which are just little uh, cloves and cover it up and water it well uh, until you know it starts to freeze and that's it and then you let it sleep <laughs> and then springtime comes and it sends out its shoots so that it can um, collect sunlight and photosynthesize and grow and miraculously you have an amazing harvest um, so there are some equations online to determine uh, how many you can fit in a given plot of area, depending on the type of garlic, of course, that you're growing. 
we grew um, elephant, German, hardneck, and uh, another variety. Luciana is watching me from the kitchen. So if you want to type in the chat, uh, what other variety? Um, and so, yeah, the garlic is amazing. I really hope you you do it. And um, also, the other thing I wanted to mention is if you look at the price right now of organic garlic per pound, it can be upwards of $20 a pound. And um, hey, Farmer J. <laughs> um, $20 a pound for organic garlic when you could be easily doing this at home and you really don't need a ton of space. We grew, um, I'll give you the numbers once we're done harvesting and cleaning up all the garlic, we'll put a post up and talk about how many heads of garlic we got from what we started with. Um, but there was only in 230 foot rows. So 230 by, um, by four. Um, four feet or three, three feet. So yeah, really, really, really amazing. Um, Farmer Jay, you can write in the chat maybe how, um, what varieties of garlic you like to grow. That'd be awesome. So garlic harvest is happening, um, moving chickens, of course, and which I talked about, um, we had homeschool. We have baby guineas that I'm taking care of. Uh, and the other things I'm noticing right now are, of course, the different plants coming in, uh, the goldenrod, the echinacea. Echinacea grows wild here, and it does in mo uh, most places, but places that are um, considered prairie or woodland, uh, echinacea really, really loves. Um, so now's the time where you can be harvesting echinacea flowers and drying those and having those available for you for winter. Mullen is also really, really important for you to be harvesting right now, especially for respiratory um, respiratory care during wintertime. Goldenrod is another one. Um, goldenrod is great for allergies and also has a lot of quercetin in it. Um, and you can do your research on quercetin, um, but it is very helpful. Uh, the other things that are coming out right now, elderberry. Elderberry for us here in the Midwest, um, of course, this is already, uh, the elderberries have already ripened over in California, but our elderberries are finally uh, ripening here. And um, if you do not have elderberries growing on your property, please find a farmer or someone who does have some trees and please get your hands on some elderberry to put in the freezer, um, which is good for up to six months and ensure that you have elderberry for the winter time. It is one of the best medicines that um, you can have for your family, friendly for all ages and really simple to make an elderberry decoction, which can be uh, cooked down into a syrup, um, either with honey, uh, typically with honey added after um, or preserved with brandy for um, those who can have alcohol. Um, and I have a, one of my favorite elderberry recipes that I can share also with you guys um, in a post. Um, so trying to think what else is happening here on the farm. Lucian also planted another uh, few rows of carrots, beets, radishes. Um, Oh, I fixed up the lean to house greenhouse and put in spinach, lettuce, arugula, cabbage, broccoli, and rapini. So excited for those to come in. And we're preparing for a workshop this weekend on beekeeping and uh, natural beekeeping. We have, I think it's almost sold out, which is really exciting. Um, so on Saturday, we'll have almost 20 people here to learn about bees, which is so rad. I'm excited to get back in that, in the flow of teaching. Um, so the topic I wanted to share about today, um, just give me a moment for a sip of water. Mm 
Um, it feels weird to be in quiet, I have to admit. <laughs> it's a little, um, it's quite strange for me. Anytime I'm away from the children, I still hear like crying, echoing in my in my head or screaming or whatever it is. So, um, so today I wanted to talk about, you know, women on the homestead. And um, it's something that I've been been thinking about quite a bit lately. It's actually been consuming my thoughts. Um, and I'm gonna do my best to uh, offer this in a way that's like really meaningful and has some you know, value for those of you who are watching live and of course the replay. Um, so, you know, women, women right now are, I'll, still, I'll, I'll start by saying people in general, men and women are experiencing a lot of um, change internally and personally and collectively, given that we've been through so much in the last two years uh, with shifts in the economy and health issues and, um, and these uh, systems put in place to keep us really isolated and restricted from one another. There's been a lot of, um, obviously a lot of healing that has, uh, that needs to be done, of course. And a lot of people have been really drawn to, of course, homesteading. Um, I think that this homesteading revival that I'm seeing really exploded during these couple years of phases of quarantine and things like that, um, because it has been given giving people maybe a sense of hope and excitement for um, living in a way that, of course, feels more natural. Um, I feel that a lot of people are frustrated with uh, living in the city, possibly living in systems that are really controlled. And, um, and so the appeal of homesteading and living off the land has been, of course, really, uh, really out there and feeling kind of really prominent in a lot of people's minds. And there's evidence, of course, of of this, there have been, you know, a lot of people leaving the cities and buying up rural land all over the country and all over the world. Actually, we're seeing these phases, um, not these phases, these trends happening in European countries where, you know, folks are our age and our generation are going back to the villages that they, you know, grew up in and had left uh, for the city life. And so I think a lot of this is is really beautiful. And um, but of course, like and with anything, I want, you know, I always encourage these big shifts and these big changes that people take on in their lives to be grounded in in what's really true for you and your family and, and what really resonates. And it's no surprise that, you know, a lot of women are, and mothers are feeling especially, um, especially drawn to, to doing a, a leap of faith like this, to leaving their community behind and jumping into taking on a project like running a farm or running a homestead. And I have spoken to many women who have done this <laughs> aside from me. There are many women that uh, we have met, many families that we have met here just in, in our town that have relocated with the hopes of um, homesteading and having a different lifestyle. And, and mothers and women um, often are some of the first to kind of initiate this change. And and I've been thinking a lot about what is the future of not just homesteading, but what is the future really of farming, of farming look like? And this question comes to my mind because even though we have a lot of folks who are um, thinking about homesteading, 
uh, which is awesome. Um, there's been a lot of things in the farming world that have also come out of the quarantine uh, phases that we've been experiencing. And some of those big changes have been um, massive uh, altering to the farming industry in this country that we know. Um, and so what I'm getting at here is that um, there's just like the, there is a, a swirling, there is an awakening happening right now. And of of wanting to, of course, create like try to find some kind of simpler life, Let's try to find something, you know, away from the city. But what I'm trying to offer here is can we ensure that it's grounded in something that's really valuable for you and for your family and for your community at large? And some of those things that folks are honing in on is, of course, health, which has been a huge, huge, you know, um, topic coming out of, of what we have been experiencing the last two years. There's a lot of influencers online talking about health and, and what does it mean to be healthy and returning to an ancestral diet and growing gardens and things like that. And um, this is important and this is valuable. And at the same time, um, there's still though this like forward motion of, of farming the way that it always has been um, which is falling short and which is not going to um, help us in the long run, even organic farming. So these are the things that I've been thinking a lot lately, and I'm going to try to unpack all of that now. Um, there have been two things that have really been kind of uh, exacerbating my frustrations with the kind of like farming agricultural world right now and the homesteading community is um, first is the fact that there is someone that is buying up <laughs> I don't want to say his name there is someone who is buying up huge huge amounts of land in this country um, in an effort to uh, control that land to turn it into crops, mono, more monocrops. Um, and this is very concerning for a lot of reasons. Um, first and foremost, that, you know, some one particular person with his entity is owning that much land in this country um, that has that much control over so much, uh, so many parcels of land is, should be concerning for anyone. Um, the second is that the plan is to then use it for monocrops of plant material. Um, and third is that those, those uh, crops are to be used for um, processed and modified foods. Um, so this is very concerning to me <laughs> and I hope it's concerning to you too. Um, and the second thing that uh, has been really, really, uh, frustrating to me is that the influencer community, um, folks who are even doctors who are have a lot of following out there, who are promoting um, ancestral diets, um, eating more animal protein, and um, of course saying no to processed foods and lab created meats and things like that, which I agree wholeheartedly. Um, these folks are still not talking about the sourcing that is necessary. Um, you may have run into conversations online or folks promoting beef liver or raw milk, like I just talked about, and pastured, you know, free range eggs. If you have gone to the grocery store lately, you may have noticed that the price of many things has gone up quite significantly. Um, and so here we are again in, in a place of messaging and media telling us these things that we should be consuming because it's better for our health. And we still 
are not talking about where is the sourcing and where is all of this going to come from. Um, if you look at, as just one example, if you look at um, some of the influencers who are out there talking about, you know, beef liver, for example, and I give this as a, the main example because it's just like so out there, so mass conversation right now. You know, beef liver pills, you'll find this conversation both in women who are talking about um, postpartum nutrition, you'll talk about, you'll find this men in men talking about, you know, returning to ancestral diets, you'll talk about beef liver, you'll hear about people talking about beef liver for children, but they're getting these supplements from, you know, New Zealand or, you know, other places across the world. And the whole point here is that, um, oh, hello, there's someone saying hello from Central, oh, hello from Lynn Creek. Hey, Karen. Um, we're still not tackling the conversation of where these amazing superfoods are going to come from. And um, I think that we're at a pivotal point right now uh, in time in history for women um, to really step into this, like, into the role that we have always been carrying, um, just have been removed by culture and by, um, you know, how we've been raised and, and things like that and the system that we're in. Women have this opportunity to lead their families into a more sustainable and regenerative um, livelihood. And not just their families, but also be a pillar, also be a center for their community communities for the same health and nourishment that her family is given. And so what do I mean by this? <laughs> My main messaging for anyone who's listening today is that if you are a young woman or a mother or a woman who's older beyond her childbearing years, and if you love growing food and if you um, are concerned about the future of food and if you want to nourish your family, um, I highly encourage you to think about stepping into a more agrarian role. Um, and what I mean by agrarian role doesn't mean necessarily that you have to become a farmer, which I actually would love for you to become a farmer. But what it does mean is that you can facilitate um, a new system or a remembering of old systems uh, where people in community were supporting each other with nourishment. And um, I realize that this is a long trail of thoughts, but I'm glad you're still with me listening. Um, women were the original um, Oh, sweet, Karen. She says she's replanting a lot of her things that um, Karen says uh, she's replanted a lot of her things that are drying out. That's awesome, Karen. Um, women were the original um, land tenders. We were the original um, seed keepers. We were the original ones that followed the seasons. And of course, we were the ones to deliver babies and to support women and um, to hold community together. And never do I devalue the presence of the masculine because that's not what this is about. The masculine, of course, has its very powerful role in ho farming, homesteading, family. It's, of course, the masculine is always important for the balance of the feminine. But what I'm saying right now is the feminine energy is what is being awakened right now. And, and not just, you know, um, we see a lot of it in, um, in yoga communities and nutrition and now, which is even more exciting, um, mother care, postpartum care, delivery of children. But the feminine is really, really needed in the agrarian world we will never reach uh, 
a system where we can feed millions of people if we're doing it the way that we always have been for the last 100, 200 years, which is very industrial, which is very systemic, which is very um, extractionary. If you bring the feminine energy back into the agrarian sector, I truly believe that the, the issues of health and um, food shortages and uh, you know um, access to wonderful, clean, nutritious food will not be a problem. And how do we how do we get there? I only have 20 minutes left, so <laughs> I'm going to do my best to con con uh, continue to condense and distill my thoughts here. But the feminine can really, um, really bring the next phase of agriculture into balance, or at least into a more promising trajectory. If we look at the feminine essence in permaculture, um, which is what my partner Lucian has like built his career on. Um, and I think this is part of the reason, one of the reasons why I originally fell in love with Lucian is because he truly understands the feminine essence of permaculture. The feminine essence of say example permaculture is the fact that it looks to nature for the solutions and for the answers. It looks to balance anything that man uh, has introduced or is trying to manage, quote unquote. Um, it looks to nature on how to make that successful, how to make that possible. And the feminine essence is, the, is Gaia, is what surrounds us, right? Now, the feminine essence could be brought back into into agriculture, large scale agriculture as we know it. And we've seen small pockets of success with these um, transitions happening. And I'm not just talking about organic agriculture, a crop growing of organic foods, um, or even you growing organically on a farm. What really is the feminine essence, the feminine cultivation is growing plants and animals in a holistic system. Um, and can you imagine if, if we had more, more women carrying more of this feminine essence into the agrarian sector at large, what could be possible for um, the future of farms? I imagine, I like to dream and imagine about uh, a world where there is a, a small farm, family farm within every town um, and multiple within every city. And those small farms are supplying and supporting their local communities with herbal medicine, with food, with honey, uh, of course, vegetables and fruits and animals where applicable in terms of size. And women um, or anyone who's carrying that kind of like feminine essence within them have this opportunity to return as a community leader by stepping in and running these enterprises. The homestead is a powerful place for someone who is interested in becoming deeper, deep, more deeply connected to the earth or to nature and to have more food sovereignty. The homestead is a wonderful place to start that. And as I continue to um, kind of like bloom as the next person, the next phase of myself on the homestead, the homestead is showing me that there's so much more. Um, the homestead is showing me, my homestead is showing me that it is not just for my family. It truly is an opportunity to bring in my community and be the impetus to create something within my reach of people um, to really create some positive change. 
And again, with the emphasis of health, uh, community, connection, and food sovereignty. Of course, this is not to say that we don't need male farmers. Again, that's not what I'm getting at. Um, the masculine is so needed for the feminine to be able to be grounded um, in her work and also to really support um, the feminine in ways that the masculine is just really, really great at. Here's an interesting uh, offering. Uh, example, you know, um, even though I'm like pretty strong, pretty strong physically, I am not as in my peak that I once was um, when, when I was farming full time. And there are many things right now that physically I can't accomplish what like I once did. Um, and maybe I could if I had a little bit more training. But the fact is, I have two little ones with me all the time. And there are a lot of projects that Lucian graciously helps me with, even if I pester him a lot to get it done. Um, things that his strength and his um, ingenuity and his creative process uh, really executes really beautifully. Um, and it's not just manual labor, although he does most, he does all of the manual labor pretty much uh, in terms of fencing, moving, shoveling, a lot of those things I plug in when I can. Um, but that's just like one really simple example of the feminine, feminine and the masculine, like really working well together in the, in the homestead space. So the feminine cultivation, which keeps resonate, resonating in my mind is, is an opportunity for mothers and women and those who are carrying the feminine essence, um, to really step into another role that is um, really calling to many of you out there. You may have felt it. You may have felt a desire to become a beekeeper. You may have felt a desire to work with plants or understand herbalism. You may have had a recent desire to grow your own food or attempt to having a garden. These are all um, touch points of awakening, really, that is kind of stirring within all of us. The feminine cultivation um, really gives us this opportunity to return to um, systems that are uh, matriarchal and um, could provide a lot of healing. What would it look like if a farm was a center of community? or a homestead like ours. Instead of an actual city center that is created from, you know, taking land and building a, a, a mega building, using energy and all these things to bring people for entertainment. Or even a farmer's market. What if that was on an actual farm? What if your preferred place um, for entertainment and community gathering was at a farm? You know, the farm could become and should be, in my opinion, like a, a town square. And I would venture to imagine that in agrarian societies, um, where most people did have their own plots of land, pieces of their own uh, homestead, that the town square was sort of like the farm uh, where there was vendors and artisans and animals and all things being bartered and traded. And, and that model to me is so resonating in my mind right now, because I just feel like what the city is offering and, and what we have been so indoctrinated to into our culture is just not, um, it does not provide the, the nourishment that we need in an emotional and physical and cellular level. So I invite you to think about what would it look like for a farm to be a community center? Um, what would it look like for you 
to step into a more agrarian role. Um, could you imagine yourself running a small farm full time? Could you imagine yourself stepping into a leadership role in a school garden? Could you imagine you taking on the creation of a seed bank for your local community? Could you connect with all of your neighbors um, and talk about the strengths of each person and creating a local economy? For example, Say there are 10 houses in your street, and maybe you have a cul-de-sac. Could one of you uh, grow corn for the summer? Could one of you grow tomatoes? Could one of you be really good at pickling? Could one of you make soap? Could one of you have bees? Uh, could one of you be really good at cooking and show the other folks how to cook? And then could you all share together? My girlfriend talks a lot about how this movement to homesteading could also be um, driven by like more of a consumerist kind of um, mentality behind it. And I can see that because a lot of homesteaders um, are, are still consuming a lot from the system. And we are not perfect either. I think a lot about how the staples that I'm still buying, could it still, could they be replaced by things that I grow here? But she mentions a lot how it's, it's kind of becoming this fad almost, or like another thing to catch up with, another thing to be cool at, quote unquote. Um, there are a lot of beautiful, profiles and social media platforms out there and Instagram, you know, people who are making homesteading really beautiful um, because it's staged and they spend a lot of time like getting the perfect shot. Um, but of course, they're not also displaying like the, the hard work, the, the blood, sweat and tears that is required to make it possible. The um, the real sacrifice that comes with like jumping into, into this kind of lifestyle when everyone else and the majority is, is not. And, and that brings me back to my point of like, of, of, you know, women, mothers really kind of stepping up and stepping into again, this, this opportunity to take more leadership in the agrarian world. This also looks like attending city council meetings and making sure that, or trying to fight for land so that it's not developed, beautiful prime farmland, um, connecting with other local nonprofits that could help um, prevent that land from being bought and actually transitioning it into small farms or urban farms or school gardens. There are so many ways that we can plug in and use the skills that we have it's okay if you don't wanna be a farmer, but I feel like we're at the point now where every one of us should be fighting for the future of our food, the future of our families and the future of our communities. Of course, we could make the decision not to and just live in a, a place of ignorant bliss, you know? Um, but if you feel any kind of fire within you about what's happening in the world right now, I really encourage you to seek out a way in which you are um, contributing to a change that leads us back to, again, a more feminine way of um, growing, distrib distributing, and um, processing the food that we we have in our in our our world this is applicable everywhere um i also want to say that we're also at this turning point where 
um, for the last 30, 40, 40, 50 years, um, women have been the target of incredible um, media and marketing and propaganda around convenience and the shifting away of the shifting of mothers out of the home into the workforce. And this is not a conversation about uh, feminism and, you know, do women and men have equal uh, rights in the workplace? This is not my, I'm not going there right now. My point is, is that removing women and mothers from the homes has been a huge crumbling of, of our communities. Um, and with that ushering of women's out of the home came the ushering in of convenience, mostly around food. And that's why we're, one of the main reasons why we are here now with the foods that uh, we have access to, um, heavily processed, easy to make, and things like that. Um, it was because our moms weren't at home cooking anymore and weren't at home um, being in charge of what goes into the bodies of her of her family. And I spin it that way because we have been told a lot that being a homemaker or someone, a mom who's a stay-at-home mom like myself right now, um, is a bad thing. And this is something that I have also struggled with, not being in the workforce anymore, not having my own like quote unquote career out there in the world, not being forward facing when I did have all of that. Um, but to be at home with my children and my, my family um, actually is one of the most powerful positions that I could carry right now in this time. And that goes for any mom who is in the same role I am or any mom that longs to be in that place. <laughs> Aaron said, yes, sister. <laughs> um, we are in such a place of immense power to be able to dictate like what comes into our homes and what doesn't. And because we have been blindsided and fed so many lies about what's better out there than actually, um, you know, taking the time to nourish ourselves and our families and our communities and the earth that we walk on, um, that what's better is out there and none of those things are worth it. That's why we are where we are today, in my opinion, of course. Um, it says my internet connection is unstable. I apologize. Um, so in addition to women, um, women having this opportunity to, you know, step into more of an, an agrarian leadership, um, I also encourage you to think about what does it mean for you um, if you're a mom, if you're a mom hoping to be a mom, if you're a wife, anything, um, if you're, a, you know, carrying a family, um, how can you step into a place of power and look at your, your role again is actually something really, um, sorry, I'm going to cry, <laughs> really beautiful. And I'm not advoc advocating for women to not be out in the workforce anymore. That's clearly not what this is about. Um, we need women everywhere. We need the feminine essence everywhere to balance um, so much of the harshness that's in our world today. Um, but it's an investigation of what's what's happening in your family and and what kind of um, steps you can take to um, you know, really ensure that your you, your family, and your greater community is is really thriving. Um, that place of power, that we can take back and and claim that us being the center of our family or us um, taking care of our family is an opportunity for us to again bring back that feminine balance, that feminine essence. Um, and with that, you know, again, taking the time to 
have a garden, taking the time to, thank you, Karen. Um, Karen saying that what you're saying about women is very true. Thank you. Um, women who, and mothers, I'm at seven o'clock, so I'm gonna take a few more minutes. <laughs> women and mothers who want to homestead, I, I'm all for it. Um, it's really hard work. And I know that there are mothers that I see out there that are managing more than I can manage at this point, um, who are managing a full garden with their children in tow and their kitchen and their house. And I, I bow down to you. I have not learned my, that type of flow yet. I have not mastered it yet. And that's okay. Um, but if you're in a homestead or if in, you're in the city um, or if you're in, in the rural space, there's an opportunity for you here um, with or without children, married or not. Uh, there's an opportunity for you to bring your feminine essence into the spaces that are overlooked right now by our greater society that we have entrusted to the system, which is um, of a more harsh energy um, and I'm not just going to say masculine because it's not just masculine that's for that's at fault. Um, a system that really has been extractionary, that has been um, not concerned with our health, our vitality, our longevity for us as people and for the planet. Um, we have this opportunity to step into spaces that are still, again, so claimed by and run by um, these harsher uh, energetic systems. Industrial agriculture, like I mentioned, and all of the trickling down, the trickling down of that. So moms, women, <laughs> anyone carrying the feminine energy, my message again for you today was very, uh, I hope it wasn't too much of rambling. Um, really find a place for you to plug in that is related to farming, related to homesteading, related to growing food. Take it on and dive in and do it. We really need you and we really need your energy and your presence. Um, we need you to be showing your children how to grow food, how to forage for food, how to be in nature. We need you to make medicine for you and your family and to share with your community how to do that as well for them. We need you to learn how to, um, you know, be a doula even. We need you to step into all these spaces. Um, I won't talk about birth work right now because it's a little bit of a sidestep. Really focus though on, on agrarian roles. Um, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to continue to expand upon this, um, these ideas. Uh, thanks for joining me today. I really, I'm just looking over here at the comments. Um, <laughs> I hope Lucian enjoyed it. I think he's still watching. <laughs> me from the kitchen. Um, yeah, I really appreciate all of you being with us every week. I'm really grateful to Lucian for starting this series. Um, even though it's been a challenge for us to have uh, consistency, if it's he and I together or who it is talking, I think the important part is that we have shown up every week and um, we continue to pour our hearts out into this ether, into this space and hope that it resonates with some of you. Uh, I really pray that um, our stories are giving you some kind of inspiration, giving you a little bit of little nuggets here and there of um, exciting things to learn more about. And I really appreciated this time here in front of the camera. <laughs> without children um, and really just kind of dropping into a space that um, I've been and things that I've been ruminating on for a long time. Okay, so it's 704, I'll wrap it up. Um, thanks again for all of you who are on Facebook and who've been 
um, commenting. Thank you so much for joining on Instagram. Thank you for watching the recording and we'll see you next week. Be, care uh, be careful out there, be well, and take care of yourselves. Bye for now. I'm gonna try and figure out how to turn this off. Need help? Yeah. Huh? Yeah. Just this one over here. Click on the screen. How though? Mm -hmm. Use the mouse. The mouse is on the other side. Go that way. Oh, it's this way. Mm -hmm.